Hey, welcome to Piercing with Scott live stream where we answer a lot of questions. You guys send them in and I answer them as best of my ability as you send those in. So now when you're sending your questions in today, make sure to be as descriptive as you can. How, like, how old your piercing might be, what your problem is, if you think you know what caused the problem or what your aftercare is. I know it's a lot of different things, but the more you tell me, the better I can answer your questions. Again, my name's Scott Wilkinson. I'm a body piercer here in Las Vegas. I've been piercing since 1994 and I own and operate Piercing Vegas here in Las Vegas, Nevada. So if you're ever interested in getting pierced by me or anything like that, check us out on our website. It's piercing.vegas. Or if you're coming to town, make sure to set up an appointment so you have me set aside some time just for you so we can put a hole in you. Excellent. And of course, behind the camera over here, we do have Jared. Jared is uh, going to be the voice behind everything you hear as he asks your questions for us. So, okay. Jared, how are we doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. I'm All ready right. to do another big day of questions. Excellent. So much fun. So, starting off, I have a question from earlier. It says, if your ear gets dry and flaky, does that mean you're allergic or sensitive to the jewelry? Like, or is that normal? Um, it kind of depends where you are in the healing process. A lot of times during a new healing process, your skin is going to swell or the whole area is going to swell. And once you traumatize some of that skin, that skin dies. It's kind of like a sunburn or a windburn. And sometimes that skin will just flake off. So that's kind of normal. Now, if the whole area is flaking off and it's way past that swelling time, it could be an allergy. Now, in my experience, when people generally have allergies to piercings, it can cause, like if it's a facial or somewhere in the ear, it can cause long-term headaches. Um, sometimes you're going to see the skin making the hole look bigger because the skin's trying to grow away from the metal that's causing the problem. It's a real common thing for it to happen. So if it seems like the hole's going bigger or the jewelry's falling inside, um, that could be a sign of the allergy as well generally piercings heal up pretty quick and they shouldn't be too problematic. You're just getting a lot of crusties and things along the way. But if you're constantly getting crusties um, or that dry skin flake like that is constantly coming off, I would maybe check into an allergy. But new thing, it's pretty normal. All right. So we got a question from chat here asking, we have a new bridge piercing. Well, not really all that new. It's about okay. 10 weeks old. Okay. And the question is, is when is it time to downsize? It could be now. If you have a bridge piercing, Everyone heals their bridge piercing differently and the swelling fluctuates. Some people, it's a couple months and you're good to downsize. If it's like you constantly have that same amount of bar every single day, yeah, it's time to downsize. But if one day you wake up and you don't have any bar, the next day it's back and forth, you still need to wait longer. So, But once you have a good solid week, maybe a couple weeks where it's always out, you might want to downsize a little bit. Now, one thing to keep in mind, you need to check early in the morning. When you wake up, because you're generally sleeping with your head down, there's more blood flow to your head, piercings are going to swell more while you're sleeping. So if you check it as soon as you wake up, that's going to be the best time to see how swollen it actually is going to be. That's the worst I generally see it is in the morning. So good question. All right. What else we got here, Jared? All right. We have a question about breastfeeding and getting a new ear piercing. Okay. Should we be completely done breastfeeding before getting a new piercing? Or is that something that can be done simultaneously? It's a fantastic question. Um, the thing is, is generally when you have a newborn, the doctors and the people I've, I've talked to have said a minimum of six months before you should start getting pierced. Six months is generally when the baby or the infant is old enough to kind of prevent any anything you might be giving through that breast milk. So six months and beyond, as long as, um, yeah, six months is what I've been told. So that should be the safest point, I would say. Excellent. Yeah, good question. All right, so we have a question about tongue piercings. Have we heard about tongue piercings like negatively affecting uh, physical, like for example, sexual acts? No, I have, I've never heard that. Now, the only way I would say it would be is if you got some sort of scoop, something going side to side that is connecting the two muscle tissues together, and then you're going to kind of impede the movement and your you know, speech and so forth. So that would be the biggest issue. But typically, when you're doing a tongue piercing, it's like you got two separate muscles here, and you're going in the connective tissue between the two of them. So, And it shouldn't be so far back. Um, when your tongue is pierced, I'm going to draw a picture for you here. It's kind of cool. Um, you 
Okay. So we're going to show this here. Now, the top one is when your tongue is inside your mouth, you have a little bit of an L here. Okay, so it's kind of sitting inside your mouth. But when you stick your tongue out, it gets longer, and this L part disappears. Now, right here is the furthest back we should be piercing to accommodate room when it's sitting in your mouth with it closed to where it sits in your mouth naturally. Now, if I could pierce way back out here, technically I could get that bar in there, but when it rests, you're going to be trying to sit at a curve in here and it's not going to sit naturally in your mouth and it's going to impede your tongue movement as well. So if it's in the proper spot through the connective tissue through the center right there, it shouldn't cause any problems. And also you do need to give it time to heal. Generally a couple months before you do any sort of sexual play or anything like that with a new tongue piercing, you need to be fully healed before anything like that happens. But it shouldn't impede and it should be a fairly easy heal for you too. So B wants to know, what's the craziest piercing you've ever had or done to someone else? Okay, good, good, good question. Craziest one I've ever had, hands down, my mandible. I've had my mandible that, through the bottom of my chin, up inside my mouth. I've had it done technically three times. Um, it's a bad situation. Every single time I thought I could fix it, couldn't. I've completely given up on it. I have never performed this piercing for another person, nor would I. Um, it's just too dangerous. It generally doesn't work. Uh, it, it seems like a cool thing because no one else has it, but there's a reason no one else has it. Now, as far as the craziest I've ever done, probably one of my favorite stories to tell people is a guy came in one time, his name was Mike. He had four nipples and we pierced all four nipples at the same time. And uh, that's pretty crazy. You don't see that every day. As far as other weird piercings, I've done like chin piercings with curved barbells. I've done like armpit surface piercings up here. They didn't heal too hot. I've done elbow piercings. Most of them were pretty unsuccessful, but that was kind of back in the early 90s when it was uh, kind of the Wild West of piercing. So, all right. So, uh, more of a technical question for the shop, but how many days in advance do I need to schedule an appointment with you? I know I have to call to book an appointment. Sure. Um, generally, let me adjust my microphone. There we go. Uh, generally, you want to be at least probably a week out. I sometimes can get you in within a couple days, but a week to be sure to get the time you're looking for. If you're coming to Vegas, you know, schedule the right time. Are you going to be going swimming? What are you doing? Are you doing physical activities? Are you, do you need to worry about healing this piercing up? Is it better to get it at the beginning where I can help you out if you have questions and you're still here? Is this something that's going to be a simple piercing where we'll be able to do it and do it at the end of your trip? So figure that out. Call maybe at least a week ahead in advance, book it, and kind of go from there. Excellent. And my receptionists are fantastic. They'll totally help you out. So Pika Moth is uh, kind of new to your channel and was wondering how to participate Hi. in the What Should I Get Pierced series? because they're not sure if they have the anatomy for what they want. Absolutely. Um, generally, uh, some people will send in the, the series I do where I, I pick the piercings on your body where they look best, whether it's on your face and your ear, and people will send in two pictures, generally one of the front, front shot of their face and one of the side of their ear, and make sure you send in a well-lit, um, a good quality picture that I can actually see what's going on. Um, if you are normally wear jewelry, put that jewelry in. And then also mention your name, maybe where you're at in the email, let us know. And we're going through the list. The list is getting kind of long, but we're trying to find a way to get through this faster so we can get a lot more of these videos out because everyone wants to know. Um, people will request that, hey, would, it be, would, a, would, a, would a rook piercing work for me? Generally, when I go through these, I'll tell all the things that I think would work well for you. Not necessarily look the best, but would work well. And then I would also suggest at the end what generally looks the best on you too. So that's the, the progression of which I'm hoping to go with the channel, which is kind of a fun question. So we're going to change it up a little tiny bit, but it's still going to be super, super fun to do. So. All right. Stella wants to know if it's possible you'd need to downside an eyebrow pier downsize an eyebrow piercing after a few months because they were pierced in July. Mm -hmm. uh, or is that a sign of rejection that they've now got a long bar? It depends on your piercer who did your eyebrow piercing. Some piercers give a little extra room for swelling. Some people keep it a little bit tighter. Now, in my experience, when I do the piercings, I keep it a little bit tighter. You might see a little tiny bit of the bar, but I don't give that much room for swelling because there generally isn't that much in my experience. Now, 
there can be a little bit of swelling. And if the bar is too long, you definitely want to downsize. But the thing you want to keep in mind is once you downsize, maybe take a picture with your camera and Okay, I guess I still have my uh, stuff going on in the background here. But yeah, I'll take a picture and check that once in a while and make sure that it isn't rejecting out. That does happen once in a while. You just unplug the black Amazon thing there. <laughs> That's all we need to do. Is that, that just the we Amazon We were so girl? confused. Yeah, a little Amazon girl talking to us. You see, we're all kind of like, where is that coming from? Who? We all turned our phones off. What's so? <laughs> oh, we're live. Yes. Yeah. What's up? Uh, <laughs> So my manis piercing were pierced uneven. I took one of them out to heal it and get it re-pierced so we can even it up. Mm -hmm. How long should we be waiting before getting that other side re-pierced? If you took it out right away within a day or even a couple days, typically these heal pretty quick. Now, the thing is, is you're going to kind of feel that scar tissue. You want most of that scar tissue scar tissue to dissipate as much as possible. I generally tell people a minimum of a couple of weeks to a month. Now, if you've had it in there maybe a week or longer, I'm going to say a minimum of a month. Now, the more you get that redness, discoloration, and scar tissue out of there, the better and faster it can heal and look for you. So that's the biggest thing. Make sure that redness and the scar tissue is gone and you can kind of go from there. Excellent. Ask me if I'm a truck asks, can I go a truck? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The question that they're asking you is if they can go swimming with a nostril piercing that's one year old. Yes. Yes, you should be fully, fully healed up with your nostril piercing at one year. Typically, this piercing is going to be healed up in maybe two or three months to be fully, fully healed up. I sometimes tell people waiting up to four months before you put a ring in because you're still healed, but you want that hole to be relaxed before you put the ring in there. But as far as swimming goes, typically most piercings are an open wound for around a month. If they got snagged and caught and it's an open wound, just like a cutter scrape on your arm, that's dangerous to go swimming in sort of any sort of pools, lakes, things like that. Hot tubs, Hot tubs and pools, I'm sorry, have all the chemicals and cause more problems. It's not as much worry for infection. It's lakes, rivers, and oceans that can cause big problems with open wounds. And it makes sense because there's more like natural living It's things. an open, yeah. Like your skin protects the things from getting inside there. And if you have a cut or a scrape or a fresh piercing, it's just an open doorway for those germs to get in. Absolutely. So we talked earlier about the 10-week-old bridge piercing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the question is, is can we get a third eye piercing now, even though we're not quite done healing on the bridge? Is it okay to double that up? Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem at all. It depends on how close you are to the other piercing. And it also depends on what kind of third eye you're talking about. Is it a surface bar where it's actually, you know, to enter and exit hole, or are you talking a dermal anchor? Dermal anchor is definitely going to be an easier heal with that. Surface bar kind of keeps things pretty stationary. But at the same time, if you're healing thing one thing up, might as well heal it all up at the same time. It's all going to be red and all ready to start off with. And it's Especially kind of if it's in the on, same so. area. You, know, yeah. you have to avoid it with the towel anyhow. Correct. Okay, question. Is there a certain anatomy for nipple piercings, like the size? So, Or can you pretty much accommodate any size nipple with different size jewelry? Um, I'm going to say 99% of the people are pierceable. Um, very few people aren't pierceable. I've seen people who have inverted nipples where the nipple doesn't protrude outside the body and it stays fully in. Now, some inverted nipples, you can actually kind of work in the area and get the nipple to come out by pulling tissue back or kind of this way. But if the nipple doesn't protrude out, that's when I'm going to say, no, you're not pierceable. Um, a lot of guys are actually worried about whether their nipples are large enough to pierce. And a lot of guys have like just pinhead sized nipples, just little tiny things. Now you can still get the tissue behind there. You might need to go into the areola a little tiny bit. I don't encourage piercers to really go too deep into that areola. Generally, that tissue will kind of regenerate and kind of grow a little bit bigger um, and stronger to kind of support it. I've never really seen one rip out unless it's seriously, seriously pulled. But do you use a thinner size? Like, do you you the size you use? Does it change based on the thickness of the nipple in question? I have in the past changed the gauge or size of the needle. Sometimes I used to pierce guys at a 16 gauge with almost like a promise that you're going to stretch it up to the 14 in the future. But I didn't always see people come back, and then I felt nervous about leaving that thin, thin wire out there because it's almost like a cheese cutter effect. So 
I generally start almost everyone at a 14 gauge now. It seems to work out really well. Haven't had any issues. But I've been nervous a couple of times. That's why I did the 16s and they just don't come back. So we've started everyone with 14s now and it seems to work. Well, now on the other side of the the extreme, uh, mm -hmm. is there a such thing as too large of a nipple that, that you'd have difficulty piercing it or? Anything? Difficulty piercing. Yeah, probably a little bit. Um, I've pierced so many different size nipples. I mean, honestly, one of the biggest ones I think I've ever pierced was inch and a quarter bar, which is like an industrial size, and that's a, a large nipple. Now, it's still healed, but that's more tissue to heal and a lot longer to heal. And I'm sure okay. it was probably much more painful, too, because there's so much more to go through. So, but so as far as size, no, that really doesn't matter. Now, the only other factor would be is if the nipple is completely flat to the breast and it doesn't protrude or kind of stay in. Sometimes those have a higher rejection rate. So I'd leave that up to the person getting pierced, whether they wanted to try to get it pierced or not. Um, Cause there's a chance there, there'd be a higher pressure. chance for it to reject if it's just completely flat. So that's kind of the situation there. Everyone's anatomy is so different. Sometimes you just got to work with what you have. And I've also had to do them before with slightly different angles because of the shape of the nipple. Um, but yeah. Okay. So next question. Just got my bridge done a few days ago and the piercer used a curved barbell. Okay. Now there doesn't, it seems like it got cut off there, but that's not generally what you advise, right? No, 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 no. I like a straight barbell. Now, you, you can kind of tell by mine how mine is not really distorting the tissue and it just kind of goes straight through. If yours is more shallow and you have that curved barbell on there, it's kind of the only way you'll really be able to heal it. But if, if your skin's like this and you're going like at a weird angle through your skin, there's a real high rejection rate for them to come, to come right out. So that's why you want to have a deep enough tissue. Not everyone can get this piercing, even though you get it in there. If that bone comes all the way up and it has to be pierced that shallow, maybe you shouldn't have got it done or the piercer didn't go deep enough. Um, some people also don't have the education and think that's the proper jewelry to put in there, but straight barbell really is the answer. All right. We're actually having a technical difficulty. We have to just take just a moment uh, sure. of your time.
one. All right, guys. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for being patient. I am a business owner and some things had to be called to up front. So sorry about that, but I'm back to you guys. So, okay. Question from Soph. Hiya, I have had my tongue done for nine years and now all of a sudden it hurts. It feels like it's continuously burnt and the underneath had a yellow white ring like around the piercing. Mm -hmm. It's sore. What do I do? And I, nothing really happened that, uh, that they're aware of. They don't know why Ouch. it's happening. Sometimes we do damage and we don't even realize we do damage, whether it's a certain type of food or talking and catching and just like you're so used to it. Sometimes you can rip and tear it a little tiny bit. So maybe go back to some alcohol free mouthwash. Um, just kind of baby it. And look, if you look real careful, you might see a little tear or something in there. Sometimes that does happen. Now, the other option I would say is sometimes when I get sick, cold, flu, something like that, piercings can act up. And I have problems personally, like when I had my tongue piercing, that would get a little tender and a little sore. Um, and when I had my belly button and my nipple piercings, they would get a little bit extra sensitive. Sometimes they're just like little things that tell you. So, you know, listen to your body, um, kind of look out for anything that could be like an open wound and take care of it. And hopefully in the next couple of days, it should start getting better for you. Now, if your tongue does swell back up, make sure you have a long enough bar in there to accommodate room for swelling so you don't get caught in that perpetual loop of it, like swelling because it's too sore and it's too sore because you're over swelling. You know, you got to give that room if that is the case. So, but if you take it out, even though you've had it this long, if it's infected or if it's sore or extra, they can still close up on you especially if it's irritated or infected like that. So, all right. So that alcohol free mouthwash, just clean it up again. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Just all right. Crazy. So question, how long is the healing process for cheek dermals compared to like cheek piercings? And do you find that cheek dermals reject over time due to the movement? I really don't do cheek dermals to be honest with you. Um, and I don't do the cheek piercings. Now you can get your cheek piercings as long as you're on the inside of the molar and you're placed in the right spot. But I've said, mentioned before how cheek piercings, um, sometimes you have that salivary gland which can migrate to the piercing hole. And I just don't want, I just don't want to be responsible for any long-term damage or things like that that could happen. So that's why I don't do it. But generally, if you go a little bit more in the forward of the cheek, it's not as big of a deal. As far as the cheek dermals, I don't know anyone personally, and I've never had them. So I really shouldn't be the one to answer that one. Dermals, I, I think a dermal is a dermal. Once you get it in there, generally, you know, you're going to have it for at least a few months. Average lifetime for most dermals, in my experience, is a couple of years. You know, two, three years, you should have it. Then if they start rejecting, make sure they go to a piercer to have it removed because if they fully surface and reject all the way out, they can leave a really, really big scar. So, and I know that's not the look. You want a little bit of a scar for that dimple, but don't make it a huge, a big war scar. wound on there. Yeah. All right. Uh, do some people swell more than others during their healing process? 100%. Um, I wish I knew all the answers why people swell. Some people, it's uh, a climate, uh, like the location where you're at, if it's real dry, if it's real humid in your area, the cold, the heat. Um, some people naturally swell, some people don't. Everyone swells completely different. Um, even on the same person, I've had sometimes a lip piercing and my whole lip just swells super huge and it's a long healing process. Get the other side done and it's like, eh, maybe a day or two, it's a little swollen, it's back to normal. And then I'll get another lip piercing and it's swollen like the first time. So you don't know so you always accommodate room for that swelling and don't plan on it not swelling especially oral piercings just an update uh two months after having their shen men piercing mm -hmm. uh karina has had no headaches or sharp head pains at all and they have been suffering with occipital neuralgia for the past three years and so now it's two months pain free so that's that's awesome that is wonderful news congratulations that is awesome all right question from christina uh, got a piercing. They've been cleaning it. It doesn't seem infected. It's a bit red, a tiny bit swollen, no pain, no pus, no bumps. Is it too early to tell if it's an infection? So I guess our only problem is that it's a little bit red and a tiny bit swollen, but doesn't really hurt. No, no discharge. Redness and swelling is part of the healing process. Your body first looks at these new piercings and 
looks at it like a sliver inside the body and tries to swell and expel it out of the body. Um, once the swelling's gone down, it's kind of when your body accepts the new piece of jewelry as part of its own and just tries to heal it as is. So, and you said there's a little bit of heat around the area? Uh, just just a little bit swollen, a little bit red, but red. No, no pain, no pus, no bumps. Redness is the healing process too. You need all those white blood cells to go to that area. A lot of times when you get smacked right away or a cut or a bruise, it's immediately going to get red because your body's starting the healing process. Now, healing a piercing is different than a cut or a scrape because it's an open wound, so it does take longer, so that redness will be there longer. Now, just like the last question, do people swell the same? No. Do people stay red the same? No. Do people heal the same rate? No. It's all different. So just do your best to listen to your body. Um, just be gentle with it. Is it red because you're hitting on things? Or it just could be part of the healing process too. So just be patient and keep cleaning it. So with wound wash spray, of course. Right. Not yes. just... Not just like any old like peroxide and all harsh chemicals. Those yeah. are bad things to yes. use. So B has a tongue piercing and they're getting indents on the roof of their mouth and the bottom of their tongue. Is this normal or should they take it out? Is there something else they can do? Um, downsize. Uh, if you're getting the indents on there and it's a new thing, I'm guessing it's a newer piercing. Because when we put that bar in there for the tongue piercing, it does have to be long. Your tongue swells quite a bit. But a lot of people like to leave the long bar in there. It's like, oh, I like to play with it. But playing with that bar is going to damage your teeth. And things like this are going to happen where it's, it's like jamming up on the roof of your mouth. So, yeah, downsize. If it's been longer than two, three weeks since you've had your tongue pierced, get a shorter bar. And that will take that indent out of there. Because that is pushing into the roof yeah, of the mouth. Yeah, it's not sitting natural in there. And you shouldn't force a piece of jewelry to a piercing. Find the jewelry to fit your piercing. So there is the right barrel out there. I promise. So Ella wants to get multiple piercings in the same ear. Mm -hmm. How close together time-wise should they be? Like at all at once or should they be spaced out somehow? What do you think? Okay. Now with this question, how many piercings can you get in your ear in like one sitting or how long do you space them out? It depends on what you're doing. Now, for instance, a triple forward helix up here. If you just want the three of them, I kind of like doing all three at once just because you're dealing with one healing process. Now, it's a long healing process, and it's going to be a little rough. Is it better to do the upper and lower, let them heal, and then do the one in the middle, you know, just kind of prolong the healing process so they're not near as bad? But in between those two, you have to wait till the swelling completely goes down and it's healed up enough to where you can put that other one in there to make sure it's at the right angle. So generally, I don't like to have more than like five, six max healing on a person at once. And it depends on the piercings. If they're really long healing processes, you might want to have less there. Now, the other thing too, is you can also boost your immune system by maybe zinc supplements, uh, taking vitamin C. There's a couple different ways you can kind of just be as healthy as possible to heal your piercings faster. Now, as far as like finding the next time to go in for the second session, as long as you're mostly healed up, it seems to be fairly comfortable and the swelling's gone down and you so your tissues in its natural state. That's when I would say go back in for the second one. So if you got like three or four heel cartilage piercings, I would give it at least three, four months minimum before you go in for the next ones. Okay. Yep. Another question, uh, talking about a double nose piercing on the same side of the nose. So the first one is healed with a corkscrew stud, they're yep. calling it. Will that cause issues with healing a second one? Second one hasn't put a second nostril a screw second, in there? A second nostril stud right next no, to it. No, it shouldn't cause too many issues. Now, generally, there's two types of pieces of jewelry that will pierce with here at Piercing Vegas. One is going to be a threadless piece of jewelry where it's a little labrette where it has a disc on the back and then the post. And then the gem or the ball has a little pin and it's held in by pressure. These are very minimal space obtrusive area pieces of jewelry you can put in there where you have room for both. Now, those didn't always really exist and we used to always use nostril screws. So if you got two in the same side with a nostril screw, you kind of have to have a piercer who knows how to bend and make that jewelry sit in the proper area where it doesn't cause problems, but it can be done. Now, don't get just regular nostril L's and have them random. You have to have it fit bent to fit your nose so 
you can do one of each too. Sometimes if you have that one in there and it's really comfortable and you put a regular threadless piece right next to it, it can actually hold that piece up there and not cause too many issues at all because it should be bent to fit your nose. So yeah, you can do whatever you want. Totally fine. All right. The next two questions are similar and pretty much going to have the same answer. So sure. I'll just kind of ask them together. Okay. First one's a little more challenging. It says, what do you tell me when I tell you I pierce myself? And then they specify that they only do safe piercings. And before that, they do research. And so far, everything's healing well. And the question right after, do you recommend piercing your own lip at home? I feel like you can probably hit all of sure, that. And then sure. what one stone, catch all of those birds. Now, the thing is, is yes, anyone can really just buy a needle. Anyone can just pierce themselves and put a hole in themselves. No problem. But as far as doing it clean, minimizing the amount of pain, getting the proper angles and the proper disposal of those sharps and things like that, there's a lot of variables that are actually involved. Can you do it and heal it up without any issues? Yeah, it's possible. The cavemen used to pierce themselves with bones and we're still here. We didn't go extinct because, they, you know, so yeah, you can, but we generally want to minimize the risk. You know, can you lick a normal door handle and be okay? Probably. Do you want to? I wouldn't, you know, I'd rather have it done the safest way possible to minimize any of the long-term effects. And that's also just, you're just taking into account because of your, your standpoint, the cleanliness issue. The other part of it is, is are they going to do a good job? Is it going to be perfectly straight? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, like, do you want to give yourself a haircut in the mirror? Like yeah. you can, but when you, let I did today. <laughs> but when you let someone else do it, they do a better job. They can see it from the outside. Exactly. They can make it perfect. I can't tell you how many people have come in with lip piercings or nostril piercings. And like, Hey Scott, can you put a ring in here? And I'm looking at it going like, who did your piercing because it's completely the wrong angle. Yeah, it looks good with the ball in the front, but there's specific directions and placement you need to do to minimize damage to your teeth, to your gums, so the ring is not all sticking out. Like sometimes you pierce to the wrong angle and you're forced to have that giant ring in there. Like sometimes you see people like, why do they have such a big, it's the only option they have because That's they didn't have it pierced in the proper spot to, you know, to have the proper size you know, fit piercing. And those are the kind of it. things that an experienced piercer knows. Exactly. You tell them I'm going to wear a ring and they do the correct piercing mm -hmm. angle to make a ring look good. Mm -hmm. And so we, your odds of you getting that correct in your bathroom mirror are probably a lot lower. Correct. Correct. Now, and the thing is, is like, what, what do I say to people who do this? They come in all the time. People are always, I don't know if they're trying to brag or if they're just saying like, Hey, you're wrong. Like, I did this and this healed up fine. Like, yeah, things can happen. I mean, like people have built their own homes before and it hasn't collapsed on them. Yeah, it's possible, but it's just minimizing the long-term effects and dangers involved. So I don't condone it. I highly suggest going in and having a professional take care of it for you. You know, I think one of the most telling things is that you're a piercer of over 20 years. You're mm -hmm. so capable and you don't do your own piercings. You you <laughs> pay story. a different True person story. to do your piercings. So yeah. I mean, like, like that alone, like if it was a good idea to do it in a mirror, you would be the most capable person to do it and you still don't. You I've still tried it before else. in the past and everything's slow and, and it's more painful because you're trying to get the right angles and everything's backwards in there and then trying to do the transfer and you miss the transfer and you drew it. It's just like the way I look at it, honestly, it's pampering. It's my time for my pedicure or my manicure or whatever it is. It's my experience. I want to be pampered and that's what a piercing is for me. It's me taking care of myself or letting someone else take care of me. For that me. makes a lot of sense. I love getting pierced. I don't know why people would want to do it themselves at home. So that's an interesting look that I imagine they had not thought of. Most people don't. I, I love getting pierced and it can be a pleasurable experience. Why do people go to amusement parks? You know, it's that adrenaline rush. It's a good feeling. Getting pierced gets you adrenaline rush. It's the same good feeling. It's just people look at it a little differently and it's, I may look at it differently too. I don't know. I love getting pierced. All right. Obviously so, everyone here does too. You know, it's just different interpretations of it couple of different uh, questions that sure. again are pretty similar and can be uh, addressed together. Uh, pencil sharpener wants to be a piercer in the future. Mm -hmm. They're currently only 16, but any advice on what they can do to prep up? And Ella also wants to shadow their local piercer and possibly become one someday. Any recommendations here? How can they get started on this path? 
this brings up a really, really good point. And that is last week I told you guys I would come up with a list of things you could do to become the best possible candidate to becoming an apprentice for a piercer. Now, if you want to become a piercer, um, you need to seek out a good piercer who's going to train you and it's not going to take a week or two. It's going to take a little bit of time. Now, as far as that little list, here is the list I, I came up so with. So just to, to verify, just to make sure for people that don't understand, there's not like a piercing school you can go to. You need to get a hold of a person who is currently a piercer. Correct. And, Correct. and have them apprentice you. You basically Correct. like, is it like working for them? Is it volunteering for them? Do you pay for that usually? How does that kind of work? There's many different ways that you can approach an apprenticeship. A lot of times people these days are paying for their apprenticeship, straight up cash. And you're basically paying for the person who's teaching you th their time. It's going to take some time to get through your apprenticeship. In my opinion, it's going to be a minimum of six months. Um, well, that's what the law says here in Las Vegas, but I think closer to a year, sometimes even a little bit longer. There's so many things you need to experience. So you want to find a piercer who's not been piercing for a year. How are they supposed to teach you a year's worth of knowledge of everything they've learned in the last, you know, you need some time. So find an experienced piercer who can teach you everything under their belt, pretty much just everything you need to know. And as far as becoming a piercer, get pierced by the person you want to teach you. You know, I'm not just going to bring on any random person for an apprenticeship unless I've pierced you several times and know you're an enthusiast and know you enjoy getting pierced. I know you personally because I'm going to be working with you for a year, year plus. I, I need to know who you are. Sometimes people just call on the phone. That's the, the only way you'll, you'll never get an apprenticeship that way unless they just straight up want your money. Like, yeah, do you guys do apprenticeships? No, they, they hang up. Well, you're never going to get one that way. You need to go there and you need to show your worthy. You need to get pierced by that person. And so you have to be chosen by the piercer. So, so that's why you're saying this list you're about to give us. These are things that if you know all this stuff, you're a more favorable candidate. We get asked all the time to teach someone to become a piercer all the time. And I'm not just going to say yes to every single, I would have like so many apprentices it would just be weird. It'd be, it'd be too much. So we got to find the right person. Not everyone's cut out to be a piercer. You got to have the right personality. You got to be calm. You got to be patient to be a good piercer. Anyone can stab holes in people, but to be a good piercer who's going to last long term, you really got to be passionate about it. It's a passion game. You got to love piercing. It's also interesting. I remember you telling me that there are some people who are very enthusiastic about the technical aspect of piercing. And then when the time actually comes, they can't push the needle through someone. They actually, Correct. That, that part's in not in head, them. You know? that, and I think that's super interesting that, you know, so you have to have all the pieces. All the pieces. Yeah. Um, a guy I used to work for back in the day, he used to make jewelry and he's like, God, I wish I could just pierce people. It would just save me so much time not having to hire a piercer all the time when I can just do it, you know, because he just sat there. And I was like, I asked him why. And he's like, I just, he says he couldn't push the needle. And that's when I learned it. So when I do apprenticeships, it's one of the first things I do is I make sure they can actually pierce. I'll clean and mark it and put the clamp on and tell them what to do. And I don't care if it's fast or slow. It's on me. I want to make sure they can actually do it. And I'm like, you'll not be punched if you miss the dots. I don't, you know. I just making sure that, that they don't have that fear before you exactly. take six months and fill exactly. their head with all that knowledge. Exactly. Interesting. So. So your list, what kinds of things can Ella and, uh, and anyone else pencil sharpen or learn here? Now this is a list. Um, basically, uh, when we're done here, I'm going to try to put it in the list in the description of the, of all the things I'm talking about here, but you should learn CPR. Okay. Take some CPR classes, bloodborne pathogen classes. This is a must. If you're going to be a piercer, you're going to be dealing with a lot of dirty utensils. Um, there might be some blood. There's, it's open wounds. You have to understand the dangers of the bloodborne path. Now, the what if to someone it sounds silly that they would need CPR training. You mm -hmm. were telling me that that's actually like the law here in Las Vegas. That, yeah. That someone on staff has to be trained in CPR. And if you really, really think about it, piercings can be very traumatic to people. Um, just like riding a roller coaster in an amusing park. People can have heart attacks. People can – you freak yourself out enough where – Things can happen. Thank God I've never had to do it here, but it's a possibility. So here in Las Vegas, we're required to have someone on staff who can do CPR and, and first aid and so forth. So, so that yeah. just makes you a little more valuable, not even just as a piercer, but that makes you valuable in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different ways. A different and it's just understanding 
customer care. It's like they're going to feel that much more comfortable with you if like for every certificate, every piece of training you have, you are going to take care of your customer. If the worst case scenario happens, you got this. So why wouldn't you know this off the get go? So CPR, bloodborne pathogens, and a lot of these can be learned online. And I don't suggest finding the cheapest, easiest one possible. Find a good long course that actually teaches it. And if you're really interested, I'm not sure if they offer it, but I know the APP, Association of Professional Piercers, sometimes offers a long-term bloodborne pathogen. I'm not sure if it's offered anyone, but if you're a piercer, that's the place you should really learn your bloodborne pathogen. And then also, may seem weird, but learn your fractions. You're like, shoot, he's telling me to learn math again. Fractions are so important. If you don't know your jewelry sizes and the conversions, it's super, super difficult. And you're going to spend a lot of your apprenticeship trying to know these. If you just know them off the bat, it's going to make life a lot easier as a piercer. And that being said, the decimal to gauge conversions, because we have the metric system now and then the gauges here, they don't exactly line up, but they get pretty close. And you're going to get customers coming in all the time asking you for one or the other. And it sucks looking like a deer in the headlights. I was such such a fractions guy for so long that people come in. I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know those numbers. So but I had to look it up. But yeah, so know that decimal to gauge conversions. The next thing, look these classes up on YouTube here. Bedside manner. To be a good piercer and not a jerk, you need to be likable. You need to know how to take care of people. There is a lot of videos on bedside manner and how to take care of people. It doesn't matter what profession you're in, whether it's massage, being a doctor or a nurse or a dentist or a piercer or a tattoo artist, we all need to have good bedside manner and take care of our customers because it is customer service customer service. Now, the other thing to do is maybe learn what to do if someone passes out. There are a lot of videos online on this too. First and foremost, don't panic, but watch these videos so you know what to do in a situation where someone passes out. Because if you're going to be a piercer, it will happen. I've had people pass out filling out paperwork while I'm trying to mark their belly button. You feel a hand on your shoulder and they start going out. I've had people watching jewelry getting changed on someone else and they pass out. So it can happen and you have to be prepared for it. So that's another thing you can learn. And then overall anatomy classes and how things heal, just overall healing in anatomy classes. You learn these online. So you understand what you're looking for, like in cheeks, like what things like, like the glands, salivary glands, how the nerve structure is. Um, and just whether things can be pierced or not. That's how I learned about the mandible. And like, you have all these different, um, like jugular veins, which run and you only have like till the smile. There's a whole bunch of information, major things you need to watch out for. And also knowledge about jewelry. If you have a piercer you like, find out what companies they carry, study their catalogs, look at all the different sizes they go up to. Not everyone goes up to huge sizes. Some only go up to 10 gauge or eight gauge or even smaller. Sometimes it's certain metals sometimes. So know these companies and what they're capable of. Now, if you go to a piercer and you have all these things and say, hey, I really wanna be a piercer. I've done this training, I've done this. I've been getting pierced by you. What does it take to become a you know a, a, an apprentice by you? I'm going to be interested, like they really, really did their homework on this, and you're much more likely to become that candidate. This is not a promise. It's just something to make it a lot easier to become that person. So Now, and this should be obvious. We shouldn't even have to say this if they listened to the, a couple of questions ago, but mm -hmm. they should not be doing piercings on their own, trying to like practice on their friends or practice <sighs> on themselves. Like that kind of stuff will actually just qualify you from a, an apprenticeship sometimes, right? Correct. I'm so glad you brought this up. That is super important. I don't want someone who's been piercing at home. That is bad practice. You're learning bad habits. I need to teach you from scratch. If you said, oh, I've been piercing out of the home for like two years. It's time to do this professionally. I'm, you're, you're, you have habits established and I need to unlearn those. We need to unlearn them before we move forward. So don't pierce people. If you want to be respected, say, hey, I, I did not want to pierce anyone at home. I'm waiting until I'm trained properly. I will respect you much more. And I'm sure the piercer who you want to train you will respect you more for it as well. Ask any of your piercers. Like, hey, if I want to be a piercer, should I be piercing people at home? I bet I know all their answers. <laughs> I bet I know them all. All yeah. right. So that's super helpful. Those are some things for everyone to kind of work Good luck on. To you. Yes. yes. And then and then find hopefully a nice competent piercer to take them on as an apprentice. Now it's, it's hard work, but it's worth it if you can get in. 
it's getting in is the tough part. Because then you can make a career of it. You know what yes. I mean? If you get yeah. in and get that apprenticeship, like you can like, you know, build your life around it. You got to do it right. You don't just do it to get your foot in the door. Like all this work at this little hole in the wall shop. It's real sketchy. It's real. You might be developing a bad name for yourself. Do it right. The people who last are the ones who do it right. Other people just like who are around for a couple of years are the ones who just go to these sketchy hole in the wall shops that don't have real good reviews and people are afraid of people oh. talk. Okay. On to another question. Uh, All right. Love from India to start off. India. Yes. Hi. Very cool. That's awesome. Uh, question, which is appropriate for a dermal piercing, a standard needle or a dermal punch? Cause I know I do see online. I see people doing it with needles, but I see, I think more people doing it with a punch. What are mm -hmm. the, what are the reasons why one would be used over the other? Okay. So for those of you who don't know, a punch is basically, it's a biopsy punch where it's like a razor blade in the shape of a circle, a scalpel in the shape of a circle. And you put like a cork or something behind it and you push and it removes tissue. Now this is going to remove tissue about the size of the dermal anchor, maybe just a little bit bigger. You grab like a two millimeter dermal, um, sometimes 2.5. But anyways, the whole premise of the dermal is your skin has layers and you're trying to go down to the bottom layer where you can take that foot and put it inside those dermal layers so you're not really necessarily healing it. Sorry, I just bumped the microphone. Now, doing the biopsy punch straight down and then you can kind of create the little pockets at the bottom layer. It assures it's going to sit flatter and theoretically it's going to heal a little bit nicer. Now, with the needle, you're kind of, you're piercing down and then you're piercing through the skin so you're not necessarily going to be going through the dermal layer so it sits as flat some piercers claim that they can get it just as flat and I, I think it's possible it's i think it's a little bit more difficult to do with the needle than it is do it correctly with the needle than it is with the biopsy punch but both can be done the big thing here is wherever you are it could be technically illegal to use that biopsy punch um, I believe because here a needle does not remove tissue and the biopsy punches can remove tissue or do remove tissue. So that's where it's, it's, it's borderline in, in, in the medicine where we're not supposed to dabble. So some cities, there's no laws we can get away with it. Sometimes there's laws that strictly forbid us to do it. So depends on where you're at. Um, sometimes we're forced to do the needle. So potentially the, the biopsy punch would be a better tool, but is not always legal to use. You're saying it's kind of how that in my opinion, I think it is. Yeah. And sometimes there's loopholes around that too, because there are companies that are making like O needles now, which are basically biopsy punches without the handle. So they're specifically made for piercing. So it's not a biopsy punch and it's a, a camphor needle or O needle. There's other names they go by. So sometimes by manipulating tools and things, you can actually find those loopholes. So it's, it's mostly about avoiding getting sued. It seems like, like, <laughs> they, like you have to <laughs> just dance around loopholes. Sometimes it's, yeah, it's avoiding getting sued. It's really sad. It's not what's best for the customer. It's about avoiding staying out of court. Well, that's an interesting and complex answer about the, really the state is. of things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> Lilith is in the process of stretching their ears. They're at four millimeters in terms of jewelry size. Should they wait and get the tragus done after they reach their goal size for the stretched ears? Or do you think they could get the uh, tragus pierced during an ear stretch? You should be totally fine. Um, if you just stretch your ear and it's a little tight and sore and you don't want someone leaning on it, maybe you might want to wait a couple of days. That'd be the only factor, but the tragus piercing should not affect the swelling of your earlobe really at all. So you should be totally, totally fine. Go for it. Highly encourage it. Excellent. So Madeline says, are nip piercings anatomy dependent? There's are two years old and don't appear to be rejecting, but there's always been so little tissue that they can see the bar through the nip when they're soft. Now, if you've always been able to see the bar through there and it's not coming out anymore over two years, you're probably fine. The only concern would be is if it got ripped or torn or like caught on something, pulled real hard. There's not a lot of tissue in there holding it in. I don't know how easy it could be ripped out, but that's my only concern I would have in a situation like that. Um, 
it's a nipple piercing, maybe take some private pictures once every couple months and just kind of compare them and have the dates on there so you can see if it looks any different. But if you don't really have any bar sticking out of the side from where the piercing is or doesn't seem to be changing, you should be fine. Should be fine. Just be careful. Don't pull on it. Uh, clarification. Remember, the ball ends are also pushing into the sides and get irritated underneath which they think might be because their nips are too flat. Is that a common issue you see, or is that actually indicative of the bar not being long enough? Um, if the beads are pushing in I, I know sides. exactly what you're saying, yeah. Sometimes a l little longer bar can help, but there is too long of a bar, too. So if, if the bar is too tight, it's like making an indent in in like the, the breast chest area or and the actual nipple itself you might want to get a longer bar. They also sell different size beads. Excuse me. <clears throat> and different size beads can probably help quite a bit. Um, just minimize the size of the bead and that dimple should go away with a little bit of time. Sometimes when you first get a piercing, we pierce right at the base of the nipple and the areola. So it is pressed up against it. But once it heals, that tissue regenerates and it does raise and come out a little tiny bit. Um, so that could help over time if it is a fresh piercing. Otherwise, if it's really indenting, get smaller beads. Nicole wants to know, to clean a new piercing, do they use a Q-tip method or do they soak it? So how, sh how should a new piercing be cleaned, Scott? Sure, let's talk about uh, the aftercare. And Q-tip so, specifically. Q -tips yes. Good? Um, no, I'm not a fan of Q-tips. Uh, the reason being is the cotton fibers, Q-tips, cotton balls, anything like that, not even q tip but any cotton swab, can actually wrap around your piercing, get pulled inside. They're, they kind of leave a lot of residue. If you can use a piece of gauze, um, like a fiber-free gauze or paper towel or something, it's not going to leave the residue, and they generally work much better. Now, as far as the cleaning goes, other than anything inside the mouth, you're going to want to use a wound wash spray which is sterile saline solution that's in inside a can. You can buy it at almost any pharmacy. Um, a lot of piercing shops will even carry it for you. Now, the thing is, is it comes in two different spray forms. First one's going to be like a fine mist where it's, it shoots it out like a V, so it's real gentle on your piercing. Sometimes you're going to see the full stream like a squirt gun. Now, most wound wash sprays you're going to find at the pharmacies and things like this are going to be made for like if you fell down and you scraped your knee and it's trying to get the dirt particles and rocks and things like that. So you need a full strong stream. But with a piercing, you want it to be gentle. So get that fine mist spray. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to basically spray directly over your piercing um, on both sides. You want it to get wet, let it soak maybe a couple minutes. And a lot of those dried Crusties basically should be super, super soft. You can wipe them off with that gauze or paper towel. Stay, like I said, stay away from the Q-tips. Q-tips generally cause more problems. The only time you can ever really technically use a Q-tip is my suggestion is make sure it's really wet. Like if you have a nostril screw and you need to tuck it up, you need to do that. You can always take a paper towel, roll it to a point and use the same way. But yeah, try to stay away from the cotton fibers. And then as far as any oral piercings, anything that's inside your mouth, I suggest an alcohol-free mouthwash. I like Biotene, but there's other brands too. Just a couple times a day after every major meal, don't really overdo it. And that's all you really need to do. Other than that, it's common sense. The healthier you are, the faster you heal. Don't touch or play with it. The only exception for touching is if you have to check beads to make sure they stay tight, wash your hands first. I have videos on this as we're checking out. Everyone has a bunch of different crazy concoctions for healing your piercings and everyone means well, but let your body heal it. That's my best advice. So what's your opinion on snake eyes piercing? I'm not a fan, not a fan at all. Um, I don't really do any horizontal tongue piercings other than the tongue web, which is that web on the underside of the tongue, um, just because it doesn't really interfere with those muscles. You get your tongue is two separate muscles. With snake eyes, you're basically connecting those two and you're minimizing your speech and you're going to do a lot of damage because those beads are resting up against your teeth and your gums. Your teeth, you're going to erode away all that enamel. If you don't erode away your gums and they fall out first, it's going to do a lot of damage. It's not even an option here. I don't even put jewelry in people. Someone says, hey, can you put my snake eyes in? I, I won't even, I want nothing to do with it. It's a bad idea. So... Emerald System says their country doesn't allow dermal punches or scalpels or anything, but they had an old second lobe piercing and they need some scar tissue removed so they can continue stretching their ears safely. What options do they have? Okay. 
I'm it's this old stretch piercing. It seems stretch. to be. Okay. Well, I'm it guessing doesn't, it doesn't mention lobe. stretch, but it's exactly. specifically an old second lobe. Okay. I'm guessing there's some scar tissue, some bumps on the back of the ear. Sometimes there's blowouts. I'm assuming they probably had it stretched out a little tiny bit. Now, a lot of times you can massage and break down that scar tissue. Um, vitamin E oil, sometimes getting vitamin E oil pills, and you put like a little pin in there, you break it down, rub that in there, that can break down scar tissue, or get a scar tissue remover, and sometimes that can help get rid of it. Um, sometimes it does take several months to do this. Now, if the if it's really, really protruding, maybe talk to a doctor and see what a doctor could do for you. Um, I don't really condone cutting or doing anything off on your own like that at home. I wish I could say there was an at-home remedy, but there really isn't. You need to talk to a professional if you can't massage that tissue down on your own. Yeah. So Jenna got her belly done in July. No pain. A little bit of redness still. Mm -hmm. Can she change it? I would wait till that little redness goes away. If it seems like the redness is from any sort of irritation or something like that, changing the jewelry is only going to make the situation worse. You're, it's how old? Uh, done in July. Okay. Yeah, it's still technically in the healing process. I'd give it a little bit longer, wait till that redness and it looks perfect, then you can change it. Okay, so... Hello, it's been a few months since I got my snake bites and they healed well, but they kind of have pockets and go inside them. It doesn't hurt. What should I do? And thanks for all the advice. You're very, very welcome. And this is a great question because a lot of people call in with this concern. Now, any sort of lip piercing, when you get it, we put a, a flat disc on the inside. Sometimes a little smaller. I go a little bit bigger. I generally like a four millimeter disc on the back. Now, once you initially get a pierced, we give you room for swelling, but once you downsize and it goes a little bit tighter, that tissue on the inside of your lip is super, super soft, and it goes in a little tiny bit. This little pocket that it creates is normal. Now, if you take your lip piercing out, all that tissue goes back to normal, and it's, it's not going to be a permanent change. Now, the thing is, is don't keep downsizing, like, oh, went in, and it's sticking out again. If you ever push on your lip, you can always get the post to stick out. You're never going to get it to where it's just stuck on your lip. If that's what you want, just glue the bead on. But <laughs> the thing is, is it's going to create that pocket. We want this pocket there because it's pulling it away from our gums, pulling it away from our teeth, and minimizing any of the oral damage that can be done. So once you've downsized and it creates that pocket, as long as your skin's not closing over the top, that's the optimum thing to do. So you're right on track. That's what we want. So excellent. Yeah. So how long do you recommend waiting to change out a DOS? Um, typically tell it's all the way healed up and the swelling's gone down. A lot of people don't get both sides done at the same time. And what I suggest to people is take your camera phone and take a close-up picture or have someone take a close-up picture of both your, your pierced off and your non-pierced off. Because your anatomy is close enough to where you'll be able to look and say, oh, it's twice the size, it's twice as thick, it's still swollen. Once the swelling's gone down and they look about the same, you don't see any red bumps or irritation, you're probably fine to change your piercing. I'm going to say a minimum of probably four months, Four to six months is probably the average amount of time, but it could be up to a year. I wish I had a better answer, but it depends on the lifestyle. All right. All about lifestyle. So Polly Pocket got their tongue pierced about a month ago. Cool. And there's a small bit of skin healed on the underside, visually noticeable, but no discomfort. Sure. Is it going to stay there? Or is there any way to help reduce that? A lot of times this is going to go away. And I... There's one of there's two different types of things I'm thinking this could be. Number one, when we do a piercing, piercing needles make a crescent incision, kind of like a hat, like a, a crescent moon, and push tissue off to the side. Sometimes on tongue piercings, that little tag might be pushed down, and that's what you're seeing. Now, over time, once that tissue relaxes, the tissue will kind of dissipate and go back into the tongue like normal. But Nothing to really concern about. The other thing is sometimes when we're healing, you're healing that fistula, that, like that tube of scar tissue. And when you push down on your tongue or out, you can see that little ring. And sometimes it comes out a little bit further. Now, once you downsize and once you have your piercing a little bit longer, a lot of time it relaxes and goes back in. Sometimes I think we just overdevelop too much 
fistula or that scar tissue on the inside to kind of just compensate for what happened. So, but it does go back to normal. Everything looks back to normal. It generally doesn't stay. So what piercings would you consider having that you have never had before? A rook. Really? Never had a rook? Yeah, that was a fast answer. I've never had a rook. I've, yeah, I've always, I don't know, I've had most everything. Um, I've never had a rook. I got to look in the, <laughs> the picture here to see if, um, I don't know. I've been kind of considering getting some uh, helix piercings again. I haven't had anything helix. I have the zero gauge up top of some, so a couple of helix piercings might be here kind of fun. Might have my apprentice do that one if he's watching the show. Um, I definitely want to get my nape done again. I used to have it, but I'm getting that done again, hopefully soon. I'm just kind of waiting for some jewelry to come in. I ordered some uh, some hammered gold discs. It's going to look pretty cool. Yeah. And what else do I want? Oh, mantises. I definitely want to get mantis piercings. I've never had them before. I think they would look really cool, heal them with studs, and eventually get it so I have some nice, tight, snug rings around there. So, yeah, I do have plans for the future. I just need to find a figure out who's going to be piercing my mantises. So it could be fun. Maybe bring in a guest artist and have someone pierce them here live in Piercing Vegas. That'd be very cool. We all want to see it. There. Yeah. I don't know who you are yet, but. All right. So cool. uh, if pencil sharpener got a smiley two weeks ago, is it normal for that still to hurt after two weeks? Sometimes. Um, it depends on the diet. If you've had some hot spicy foods or things like that, that can really irritate it. Um, depends on the jewelry. If you have a seam ring, something where there's no bead and it has like a little gap, if that's moving back and forth in an open wound, that can really, really keep the irritation there much, much longer. So make sure you have the beads on there. Um, if you're using a mouthwash that has a bunch of alcohol on there, or I'm not sure what your aftercare is, that could be a factor as well. But two weeks is still technically inside the healing process, but it's later in the healing process. So it's something you might want to check in on. Okay, Bella has two quick questions. One, they have snake bites, and one is nested. I think they're talking about what you said earlier, that little pocket in correct, the gum. Correct. And the other is not nested. Is there anything they can do to make that nest too, or is that just, you know? Okay, so snake bites, you got a, a piercing on each side of your lip. Nobody's anatomy is perfectly the same. And neither is our accuracy as a piercer. Sometimes just a slightest little angle, one might be up a little higher, the lip might be a little thicker. So that's why one might be a little tighter, created the pocket and the other didn't. So if you have any bar sticking out of that piercing, you might be able to downsize to a shorter post. Sometimes you can downsize just like a 16th of an inch, just barely anything, and it might make enough of a difference for you. But if it's already tight, sometimes you really can't downsize much more to kind of create that pocket. Um, just an idea here, just going to kind of toss this out there. Maybe if your piercings healed up enough, if you were to wear some sort of like one of those no pull discs, which kind of is funny because it's actually going to kind of pull it, it in a little pull. bit because if it's just a little bit, you'll kind of create the pocket, which might make it long enough to wear. But I'd be afraid to put too short of a post in there right away. So it Because it could get sore, too. I've always, yeah, I don't know. On my labret, I've always disliked that pocket because I find it gets sore. But if it stays in there and you get used to it, okay. see, so that's the key is you kind of got to get used to it. So I don't know if I would really encourage doing that idea. I shouldn't have said that live. But <laughs> well, sometimes yeah, no, I just keep talking and think out loud. Sometimes you can come up with an answer. But I don't think you could, maybe if you shortened it a little bit, if you had enough room, but if it's already tight i wouldn't mess with it and a secondary question from bella sure. your thoughts on bioplast some people say it's not good because of bacteria what do you think about bioplast um i have mixed opinions on it i am not a fan of long-term wearing of plastic jewelry yeah, bacteria stuff can get in there sometimes the whole a bioplast is basically a plastic labrette where it's like a threadless where you push a piece in but over time it seems like that flare flares out. So if it's a 16 gauge, sometimes you have a little bit of a trumpet horn on the end trying to push that jewelry in if it's been used a couple of times. Mm, interesting. So that's my experience. Um, now bioplast as a simple retainer going in an operation or something where it's a temporary fix or something you have to leave in for a couple of days. Yeah, that might be a good idea. But as far as bioplast for long term, no, I'm not a fan of it. If you're worried about that because of teeth or gum damage, make sure you get it pierced properly or you shouldn't be getting it done because there's always a concern for teeth or gum damage with any oral piercing. 
if it comes loose, you go inside, you can bite it. Sometimes even plastic jewelry can do the damage. You know, like, oh, well, it's plastic rubbing up against my gums. If it's irritating you, it's still doing damage. All right. We have a question from a 14-year-old fan. Okay. They want to get a smiley piercing, and some people are telling them that it's not age appropriate. Also, is the expected oral damage from smiley piercings minimal, or is it pretty bad? Okay. Um, age appropriate. Here at Piercing Vegas, we do a minimum of 16 years old as far as any body piercings besides the earlobes. So we would not be able to pierce you until you're 16 here. Here in Nevada, it is technically legal to pierce pretty much any of these piercings down to 14. So here it is appropriate if you found the appropriate shop to do it. Now, as far as damage and things like that, it depends on your anatomy. First thing you got to do is you got to look and see how much of a web you have under there. The smiley is that little web between the gums and your lip. Some people have a nice thick web. Sometimes it's paper thin. If it's paper thin, it's probably just going to reject out and you might only have it for a couple of weeks and it's not going to work for you. Now, the other thing is depending on how much room and clearance you have. If you're wearing jewelry that's rubbing up against your gums and you have beads on there or something, gems that might be causing irritation, you could have damage that way. So you want to find someone who's going to do the piercing where it's it's almost hanging a little bit, a little bit more into the lip, into the smiley area. And once you can get away from the beads, definitely put in a clicker, a seam ring, something where it's not going to do the damage. Now you have to start off with a bead or some sort of ring where the, the seam or the gap's not going to get pulled inside at first. So it can do damage, but if you keep your eye on it, if it looks like it's starting to do damage, you take it out, it really doesn't do too much long-term damage. Now, if you leave it in the whole time, it can do some serious long-term damage. So do some, pitch, do some picture research on Google. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about, like smiley piercing damage. And you see how rings just leave huge indents in there. And mm. yeah, so it, it kind of depends. It, some people can do it, no problem. Some people have some serious problems. How long could we expect a snake eyes to take to heal? Uh, they got there seven weeks ago, and they really want to change the bar, but they're thinking that they might wait till week eight or nine. Or snake week. eyes? Yes. Um, I, I I don't do the piercings, so I don't really know. Generally, oral piercings heal a little faster than other piercings, but you're connecting the two muscle tissues together. Just so tugging on them every time you talk. I would say it's going to be a couple months before you're fully healed up at least. Yeah, two or three months. But you want to downsize? If you're doing damage, you might need to downsize. I would say the earliest you could downsize something like that would be about a month. Okay. So, yeah. uh, kind of touched on it earlier, but best, best method to clean a new bridge? The best method to clean a new bridge... Um, if it's brand new, number one, try to keep the swelling down as much as you can because the more you keep the swelling down, the less the crusties will get pulled inside. Now, keeping the crusties off there is the biggest thing you can do. Using a wound wash spray like Neil Med, and you're going to take a fine mist Neil Med spray and spray directly on your piercing two to four inches away. Let that solution soften any of the crusties because chances are you're going to get the crusties. It happens to the best of us. And sometimes those crusties last a long, long time. Do this at least once a day. Don't get in the habit of overcleaning your piercings because if you keep overcleaning, it's going to cause more irritation. But at the same time, keep the crusties off. Now, once you've hit a month and a half, maybe a couple months, you kind of got to see if you can downsize to a shorter post. Now, if you're waking up every morning and it's super swollen and it's still going back and forth, you need to wait longer. But once you can downsize, that will also help the healing process because it's not going to be have as much movement or irritation. So keep it clean with a wound wash spray. Wipe off crusties with a paper towel or clean piece of gauze. And, uh, yeah, downsize when the time's appropriate. Love bridge piercings. So. Peter got two nose piercings done the other day and the tip of his nose feels numb. Is that uh, normal? He's read on the internet. Other people have had this problem, but no explanation. Thoughts? I don't have a, a real solid explanation either. I mean, the body has nerves, the nervous system. It's like they're everywhere. So anything could be affected. As far as like long-term damage, I've never really heard anything. And I've been doing this... Since 1994, I've taken so many classes with 
the APP and different seminars, and no one's ever mentioned anything either. It's not to say that it doesn't happen. Um, you know, maybe we could do some more research and we'll see if we can find out any more information on this. But I don't think it's anything really to concern about. I bet it's just during the initial healing process, and then it probably goes away and people forget about it, would be my guess. Now, I don't know for sure. I'll look into it. This is a question that uh, we get once in a while, and it's uh, the best place to order jewelry for their piercings. Now, I know that a lot of places online have cheap jewelry. It might be poorly made or bad metals, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we don't have an answer for them right now, but we are working on that, correct? We are. We are. We're trying to put together an online jewelry store for you guys so you have a good solid source for your jewelry. It's in the works. We're not there yet, but hopefully sometime in the near future we can get something going for you. Now, as far as finding a place online, there's no solid, true answer. Sometimes you can search by certain brand names, and certain companies might claim that there are certain brands, but you also got to remember that there's a lot of knockoffs out there. Yeah. Um, Super easy just to, to buy the cheapest thing I can find and then rebrand it like yeah. it's real. Yeah, Amazon and Etsy are scary. You can find good stuff, and you can find just absolute terrible, and you just you just don't even know. Um, I get a lot of people coming in from with jewelry for me to put in from Etsy, where people are just like, "Oh, I'm now a jewelry maker, and I'm just making this body jewelry," and they're random gauges. You know, sometimes twenty six gauge, twenty four, like so small, and the designs aren't the right size. So you got to be careful. I love handcrafted stuff. But you need to find someone who's a jewelry maker, a jewelry maker of body jewelry. There's specific sizes and gauges and different requirements for materials. So I don't have a true recommendation yet. All right. So yes. we will get back to you on that. Yes, we uh, will. So we have uh, someone who wants to get an industrial piercing, wants to know how long is the healing process? Expect a year. When you get an industrial piercing under perfect circumstances, which means you're not sleeping on it, it was pierced exactly at the right angle, your hair your hair product's not getting in there, your masks aren't getting caught on there, um, you're in good, healthy condition. I mean, there's a lot of perfect circumstances, but three to four months would be the earliest. But expect six months to a year, more people up to a year. Now, here's the deal. When you're getting an industrial, your piercing is going to be across from side to side. And normally when you're sleeping, your ear can kind of twist and contort. Once you have that bar in there, your ear can't twist. So if you're sleeping on it, constant irritation. And that's why this takes so long to heal. Normally when you have the ring in there, the ring is able to move up and down. Again, the bar is stuck in one position and so is your ear. So that's why these take forever to heal. Now the other factor is, is if you get a piercer who does the piercing, maybe one at this angle here and the other at this angle here, and you're trying to bend and contort the ear back to place, you can see like there's going to be some massive bumps and it might not even ever heal for you. So find a qualified piercer to do this one. It's not a simple piercing. It's not a beginner piercer. Um, beginning piercing for beginning, excuse me, a beginner piercer piercing. And that goes back to like what you said earlier. If someone thinks they're going to do this in their bathroom mirror and do a good job, that's just a joke. Because even like a piercer might not do a good job with, yeah. with both hands Correct. and eyes facing the right direction. Look, I got it in, Scott. Of course you did. Is it going to heal? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but good luck to you. But good luck to you. So we have someone that wants an <laughs> eyebrow piercing. They're also getting LASIK surgery. If they got the surgery first and then the piercing, is the healing going to interfere with each other in your opinion? I don't have an answer for you on this one because I don't know what the requirements are when getting a LASIK surgery. Do they make you take all your piercings out and all metal out of your body? I, I had PRK, which is like LASIK without the flap. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't recall them asking me if I had jewelry or having me remove anything. It was a procedure. Okay. It, it takes place like in an office laying on a, on a, but does something go over your eye? Yeah. Like, so that might rest on an open wound or something, you oh, know? Yeah. So like it the, could, you know, the clockwork orange thing that holds your eye open. Water, yeah. They do that. Yeah. No, wait for that. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like they're going to be completely distorting. And like, if it's in the healing process, you're going to have a lot of problems. And I'm sure they don't want to deal with that either. They're dealing with lasers with your eyes. So, so let them do their job, and then we'll do the simple little eyebrow piercing. Let afterwards. the eye heal up a little yeah. bit, and then get. The I think it's a super pierced. fast heal too. So yeah, yeah. I, vision over vanity. vanity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Is it possible to get a piercing bump inside your nose after a septum? 100%. Um, sometimes it happens. Basically, the septum is a, is a thin mucous membrane. Typically, that's the area we're trying to hit. Sometimes we do hit the cartilage, but most time it's through that thin mucous membrane. Now, being it's a mucous membrane, it's constantly lubricated and new piercings get crusties. If you're constantly pulling crusties through, it's irritating, and your body tries to create that barrier of scar tissue to protect it. So the best thing you can do is get those crusties off there. Try to make it as stationary as possible. Sometimes you can actually flip your septum ring up inside your nose. Don't hurt yourself trying if it doesn't fit. But if it does flip up, it doesn't allow it to move around, and sometimes it heals much, much faster that way. That's the way I do the piercings here. I tell people, especially when you're sleeping, Flip it up so it's actually more comfortable inside your nose that way. Excellent. Now, we are sort of running out of time. So even though we okay. have a ton of questions, we are only going to be able to get to a few more of them. Sure. Uh, Shane just got a PA, wants to know, can you use wound wash spray from CVS to clean it? Is that the same stuff? Yes. Wound wash spray is wound wash spray. Um, if you saw my thing earlier, I was talking about how there's a fine mist and a full stream. You really want to find a fine mist spray to clean your piercings. It works much, much better. The full stream is like a squirt gun where you get the full stream. The fine mist is going to be more gentle and it's going to last much, much longer. But wound wash spray, as long as this just says sterile, isotonic, saline solution, that's all it really is. It's, there's m many different brands, labels. They're all great. The thing is, is... The thing I like the most about the Neomed is it's pressure on pressure valve. So there's no real aerosol involved here. Um, and they make them small enough to go on an airplane. So which is super convenient, put in purse, a bag, easy to carry around. Um, and the company's just great, you know, so they guarantee all their products. So if anything's defective, they take care of us. So that's why I really like and push the Neomed. But there's a bunch of bunch of different brands out there and someday i will do the review video on all the different brands and styles of wound wash sprays so. not to go into it again but just in case goth pumpkins wasn't here when we answered the one mm -hmm. don't pierce yourself the the, the advice yeah. is just don't do it like, yeah. even, even if you have to wait even if you have to travel kind of far away to the nearest big town to find a piercer mm -hmm. who's going to do a good job like make it a goal save up for it and do it that way just don't mess it's a, it's don't a mess your experience. eyebrow up doing it yourself it's one of those things in life where just because you can do it doesn't mean you should yeah you know mm -hmm. so. all right um, and Sarah wants to know, she has nipple piercings. She wants to hide them, finds that they're visible. Maybe, okay. Maybe through clothes and wants to know, is there any tips you know about for hiding them? Sure. Um, they do make different bead sizes as far as for the nipple piercings. Um, you can find, uh, let me erase with my fingers. I'm going to show you some jewelry. I'm going to draw on a little board here. Um, normally when I do piercings for nipples, I'm going to put like a five millimeter bead on the, each side. It's a little bit bigger. Sometimes they show through shirts. Sometimes you can find a, a more padded bra or a thicker shirt where it doesn't show through as much. Now, if the bead is still coming through, you can always get four millimeter, maybe even down to three millimeter, but three millimeters is pretty darn small and there's a good risk of it getting pulled inside. So four millimeters is generally the smallest thing I'm going to go with. Now, typically you're going to have a ball. But companies like Invictus will make, be patient with while I'm drawing here. Okay, good catch. Now, typically when you're looking like this with the ball and then you have the bar going through the actual nipple, Invictus will make forward facing gems where the gems on the top side right up here where I drew the squiggly line and it's flatter. So it's going to be much more flat to the actual chest where things shouldn't show through as much. And again, those discs come in five millimeter, four millimeter, three millimeter. So if things are showing through, maybe get some of these threadless posts where they're sitting flat instead of actually having the ball. Some people will actually also go to a 
like a ring. Like you can always put a seam ring, um, a clicker, something like that in there. And the ring can actually kind of sit more flat against there, but it also can show through as well. You just need to really be aware before you leave the house what actually is showing through. But a smaller bead, maybe the flatter bead, maybe doing a clicker or something, a ring of some sort. And we'll end with a couple of questions from a, a couple of professionals, actually. So wonderful. Swag wants to know. So there's the TikTok thing, the piercing roulette. So a lot of people have been piercing themselves. Uh, wants to know if you've seen an uptick, an uptick in like clients coming in having done bad piercings on themselves recently. Um, I haven't noticed much of an uptick of people piercing themselves. I've always had a group of people who will always like brag and think they're cool, saying like all the piercings they do at home, but it's just it's uneducated people who just think it's there's no dangers involved and it's it's not bragging it's it's scary I, I don't know I don't know but I haven't seen much of an uptick of it um you might be on to something <laughs> I mean I'm, I'm sure it's some of the lower end shops in town they really have because I mean yeah. if you're the kind of person that's going to pierce yourself you're not going to go get it fixed at, at a super professional place you're going to go to the the ten dollar tattoo place or whatever correct correct that's the way it works <laughs> always so I haven't noticed personally, but uh, to say it doesn't happen here. All right. And uh, Egg Girl Comics, Comics says when they took their body art uh, practitioners test here in California, mm -hmm. it said that dermals are not permitted for body piercers to do. So uh, it seems like a lot of folks are doing them there anyway, illegally. And what are your thoughts? Are they legal here in Las Vegas? Here in Vegas, you need to have a doctor or medical professional write a note um, to the health district saying that you are qualified enough to do them. I don't know what's why that says that they're qualified to say that I'm qualified enough to do it, but I was able to get a doctor to do it almost right away for me. But there's not a lot of people here in Vegas who have that note. I was told only a small handful of us, only two or three of us or something like that. But there's sure is a lot of shops who are still doing them. Uh, that just happens. So um, when they first came out, they were very, very questionable. And they came out with different names, not dermal anchors. They were single point piercings um, because piercings have an entrance and exit point, And these, they just qualify and classify differently. And a lot of cities said no right away because it's more of a medical thing. Sometimes you need to have them cut out to be removed. And I knew if you had to get a medical professional, then you had to have a medical license. Um, so as time went on, I think some cities just say no. Some say they're totally fine. Some say you have to have the, the, the medical license or have someone write it out, a note for you, just like we do here. I'm not sure of everyone anymore. I know a lot of people are cutting back on doing them. I'm cutting back on doing them myself. They just generally don't heal as well. I'd rather do surface piercings and a lot of other options as well. So... All right. Another thing I want to mention is maybe next week when we're doing this, we're going to try to find a new way. If it's not next week, it'll be the week after of where you guys can actually send in pictures of problematic piercings and things like that. So I can pull it up on the board and you can actually have references to these things. And we're going to try to find a way to ask you a little bit more, a little questionnaire thing so we know exactly what's going on. And hopefully this can kind of evolve our channel a little bit more here. But thanks for tuning in today. Sorry if we didn't get your question this week. Hopefully you can get in next week and we can answer it then. And until next time, keep putting holes your body. We'll see you all in the next video.